So well, well, this toucan barbit is up here keeping you all company, I'll just give you a quick overview of the presentation tonight. Over the next 90 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a, a whirlwind tour of the Ecuador cloud forests and the Galapagos Islands. Um, as I was working through and, pre and uh, preparing for this presentation, I realized what an immense challenge it was to talk about all those magnificent birds in a relatively short period of time. And so I asked for some feedback from my husband, Michael, about how I might shorten my presentation. And the uh, advice I got was, or the observation he offered rather was, you know, for every bird that you present on or have a photograph of, you you were averaging about four or five adjectives. So if you add that up over the course of about 200 photos, um, so at the beginning, I'm just going to get this out of my system. What follows is around 200 photos of the most spectacular, fabulous, wonderful, phenomenal, incredible, beautiful, outstanding superlative birds. So I'm going to get all my adjectives out of my system as, as best I can up front and um, try to go through this at a reasonably speedy clip. So the we booked originally with a company called BirdQuest for our trip to the Galapagos Islands, and uh, it was going to leave in and out of Quito in Ecuador. And I thought it would be prudent to have a buffer day or two, just in case there were any snags with the travel. And then when I did research onto where we might stay in Ecuador for a night or two, that quickly, innocently enough, it began, but it quickly morphed into a five-day photography tour at the Tandiapa Bird lodge which is about an hour or two outside of ecuador and that's where we saw this guy this is the toucan barbet this is actually the first bird that we saw as soon as we arrived at the lodge and there was a trio of them uh, singing to us and greeting us as we got uh, got ready and unloaded the car and of course i don't think i heard a word that they said during check-in because i was uh, rather frantically trying to get my camera oh uh, my screen is paused here Sorry, just let me see what's going on here for the, I can't, I can't advance the slides. Let's just see. Oh, goodness. Now I'm completely frozen. Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is the toucan bar, but just from a different angle, because he's beautiful from, from all angles. And these guys were um, during our, our stay at Tandiapa, we visited three other eco lodges, and um, this guy was uh, quite easy to see at all of them. So a very friendly and pleasant bird. There were two species of barbet uh, in Tandiapa, and this is the red-headed barbet. Uh, our guide and, and I kind of developed a working theory that he may have been the inspiration for angry birds. I can't confirm that, but uh, sure enough, his facial expression, he, uh, these uh, male red-headed barbets are, uh, they never look like they're in a good, mute, a good mood, but they are a beautiful bird nonetheless. There's quite a lot of sexual dimorphism with this species. This is the female, also quite stunning. This was one of the highlights of uh, the Tandiapa Bird Lodge. This is a crimson rumped toucanat. There was a family of about six of them that lived uh, near in and around the feeders right outside the lodge. And it was lovely to see them throughout the day uh, on the feeders patrolling the, patrolling the neighborhood. They were quite uh, dominant and the other birds deferred to them. And as you can see from this photo, squirrels are a thing on bird feeders in Ecuador as well as they are here. And the uh, feeder dynamics were quite fascinating to observe. The toucan was a, or the toucanet was a rather pleasant overlord. Uh, the squirrel was allowed a few moments every day to enjoy some banana and papaya bits. But as soon as the toucanet opened its bill, the squirrel skedaddled out of there. So I, they'd reached some sort of detente or, or arrangement. This is a choco specialty in the area of Ecuador that we visited. This is the plate-billed mountain toucan. My uh, nickname for this bird is actually, I call it the Christmas Eve toucan because the night before we were visiting the location where we would see this bird, I could not sleep. I was like a kid on Christmas Eve. I woke up, saw every hour on the clock. And so I was uh, slightly sleep deprived when we saw him the next day, but uh, beyond excited. What an absolutely gorgeous bird. Um, 
the name is uh, quite apt. I'm going to flip to the next slide just to show. It's not a change in coloration on the bill. It actually is a separate plate that is on top um, of, the, of his original bill. So the red on the bill is a different color, but the name plate build actually refers to that additional layer of keratin. This is a russet uh, backed or a pendula. This was an actual, actually quite a pleasant surprise on the uh, lodge list. These were listed, I think, at about a four or a five. And so they were a very infrequent visitor. We weren't expecting to see them at all. And then five of them showed up our first afternoon there and uh, greeted us at the feeders for a few minutes. They uh, made a very loud entrance and a very loud exit. Um, believe it or not, taxonomically, this bird's actually in the same family as our red-winged blackbird. So that's uh, it's a neat fact. Of course, one of the highlights of, of birding in Central and South America is mot mots, and this is a rufous mot mot. It's, um, I couldn't find consistent information on this as to whether it's the largest or the second largest mot mot. Um, different sources say different things, but it's definitely one of the bigger of the 14 mot mot species. Uh, we observed this guy both on the on the perches and on the feeders and as well as on the ground. And what's uh, interesting is that they always left food on the ground for the birds, but also um, they would attract agoutis, which is a rainforest mammal that we uh, got to observe on a number of occasions. Very friendly little guys. So he'd be in there uh, sharing the banana pieces with the mot mot. There's a, a close up shot. You'll note the serrated uh, edge on the bill as well. This is the Ecuadorian thrush. So this would be the uh, same family as our American robin. So Ecuador's, uh, Ecuador's version of that. One of, there's many thrushes. This is another one, the glossy black thrush. Quite, uh, we were quite happy to see this one. They're normally quite skulky and secretive. But uh, when there's enough bananas on offer, they will make an appearance and, and come out and visit. So this, uh, this guy flew in one afternoon to say hello. Very, very striking bird. Here we have the orange belly euphonia. These are quite tiny. They're actually not much larger than a chickadee, but they're quite delightful uh, to see with their bright coloring. We saw two species. We saw a thick build as well. This is the male orange-bellied. This is the dusky chlorospingus with that uh, striking red eye. Our, our nickname that we developed for uh, him over the course of our stay was Spings. Uh, he was quite friendly with the hummingbirds. I wanted as well just to give you some context because you're going to be over the next hour and a half or so absolutely inundated with bird photos, but I wanted to the best that I could give you a sense of what the Ecuadorian cloud forest looks like, which is, is difficult to do. I find compared to birds, trees are rather difficult to photograph in the sense of, of capturing what they really look like. Whenever I'm looking at my tree photos, I'm always a little bit disappointed because they don't, they don't look or feel like the trees that I saw. But this gives you an idea of just the, the scale and the majesty of that forest. It was truly remarkable. The trees don't just look different, they, they feel different when it's that kind of rainforest. And so this just gives you a small glimpse of our surroundings as we birded for those five days. This was quite a special find. Uh, we took an alternate route back to the lodge after our second uh, trip with our guide. And I wondered what we were doing at first. He pulled over to the side of a relatively busy road and I thought, okay, maybe it's snack time. Um, Cause there were a bunch of corner stores about, but then he got his scope out and I thought, okay, what's going on? And of course he, he kept the suspense going right into the last minute. And then uh, this is a liar tailed night jar. And so if you look down to the bottom of the frame, that's the tail feathers going all the way down a spectacular tail on this bird. There's a roosting pair sort of in the middle of, um, I won't call it an urban area because it's it's not, but there's a lot there. It's basically just like a street of sort of um, corner stores or stores where you get um, provisions and whatnot. And this pair of night jars roosts there and has for years. And so it's uh, become quite a 
a draw for birders to come by and get, get some refreshments and check out this uh, marvelous bird. This is the Andean guan. Um, I was so pleased to get some great photographs of this bird. My experience with guans up until this point is you might get a quick glimpse of them or they'll pop out on a branch to say hello for a moment or two. This was photographed in the bird blind at the third uh, lodge we visited on, on our trip called Zora Loma. And it was quite a trek to get there. Um, it was the highest elevation spot that we visited and they had quite a neat bird blind. And this guan stopped by after we'd been hanging out there for about half an hour or so to say hello. The guest of honor though in the bird blind that day was uh, definitely the russet crowned ant pitta, or sorry, my, excuse me, the russet mate ant pitta. So ant pittas are notoriously skulky. You might hear one, but seeing one is incredibly difficult. They like to hang around uh, on the ground in the forest under study. And so it's usually quite dark and they're quite difficult to see. A lot of the eco lodges in Central and South America have started to entice them uh, out into the open by feeding them worms. And um, this one was no, <laughs> no exception. So there you go, she's got a, a full mouthful of worms. There was just the, just the one ant pitta, so she had all the worms to herself. She seemed quite delighted. There were two ant pitta species that could be seen at this lodge, but we had a, a difficult choice to make. It was a bit of a trek through uh, the forest to see the second species. And of course, with an ant pitta, you, you never know. Um, or you could remain back uh, at the feeders. And so, bit of a risk. Michael went with the ant pitta. I remained back. Uh, it paid off. He was able to see the second species, which is the chestnut crowned ant pitta. And this is actually a remarkably good photo of an ant pitta. This gives you much more of a sense of what you're usually working with when you're trying to get a glimpse of them. I was rewarded for my decision as well, because as I stayed back, uh, unbeknownst to me, it was bath time for the birds of that area. In the, some of the um, feeders and landscaping that they had set up at the lodge, um, rainwater would gather in some of the tree trunks and some of the, the crevices, and the birds would come by and bathe. And so these flower piercers started things off. This is two species, uh, two different species of flower piercer in the same shot. The black one on the left is the glossy flower piercer. And then the blue one on the right with that magnificent red eye is the masked flower piercer. Now, if you look at the really interesting bill shape on the glossy flower piercer, um, the, and their name gives you a sense of what they do for, for a food source, they will actually use their bill to pierce the base of a flower. And that's the way that they'll access the nectar. So you often will see these little guys cavorting with hummingbirds because they're after the same source of food. And uh, interestingly enough, some hummingbirds, especially the shorter build varieties like thornbills, will use that as a method of, of feeding as well. Instead of accessing the, the nectar with their bill by inserting it in the flower, they'll, they'll pierce the base. So they weren't interested in food when I was looking at them though, for that little uh, snatch of time, they were quite interested in bathing. Now this photo is not really an accurate representation of what was going on because it looks like the birds were kissing. I assure you they were not. The uh, bathtub was fiercely defended and fought over territory. And so the flower piercer was um, edged out by this rufous collared sparrow. I wanted to include a, a photo of this sparrow though in the presentation as um, they are, their, way, their range is rather broad. And one of the favorite games I like to play whenever we're traveling in South or Central America is to spot the Rufus Crown Sparrow at the airport because they're quite common and quite easy to see. So you can see them right here in the heart of the, the Andean cloud forest as well as over uh, in airports as well. So they are for that reason alone, one of my, my favorite sparrows aside from that absolutely gorgeous uh, Rufus Crown around their neck. This was the bird that saved that day because with Michael going to the forest to look for the second ant pitta, if he were to be successful in that mission, it would render our life lists uneven and he'd have one more species than me. And as we've learned over the years, that's um, not good for our marriage. 
And so I was really happy when this scarlet bellied mountain tanager showed up because uh, this was the first time in the trip that we'd seen this species. And so I was able to, to even things up and uh, reestablish that equilibrium, which is really important the day before you're about to spend uh, 10 days together in very close quarters on a catamaran. You want, you want things, you want everyone to be in good spirits. Here we have the yellow breasted brush finch. So this is the final contender for that um, bathtub. I've only taken you through a, a couple of those photos for about, I'd say 30 or 40 minutes. It was, it was just one after the other bath time. It was, it was quite a spectacle. So I am going to see if I can exit out of full screen now and I'm going to shift into the next series of birds for um, Ecuador, which is the uh, tanagers. And so this just gives you, this shot just gives you a sense of what the feeder setup at Tandiapa was like. Um, this, this log that the birds are perched on is actually hollowed out and that's where they put uh, banana and papaya pieces. And this does give you though a pretty good sense of what the action was like uh, at any given moment. And you can see this from the outside, but the lodge itself had these glorious large bay windows that you could just sit at on from the inside while you were enjoying your meals as well and just watch the birds. Oops. Hmm, let's just see, I'm closed again. There we go. Um, this is another uh, shot of just the, the feeder setup and the golden tanagers. These were the most numerous and abundant of all the tanager species that we saw. Uh, this gives you an idea at, at any given time, there was quite a, a number of the golden tanagers. There was never, never just one of them. They were always in a, in a group. But of course, there was sometimes danger at the feeder. This is a Tyra. I may be mispronouncing that. It's spelled T-A-Y-R-A. It's a rainforest mammal that ranges from southern Mexico to the top half of South America. Um, and this guy actually came by in the afternoon and toppled the entire feeder setup. So um, the <laughs> we had to go head out to the back deck and watch hummingbirds while things got set up. So it wasn't uh, wasn't exactly a, a calamity or a crisis because at Tandiapa there are um, birds in any direction. So the front of the lodge is more the tanagers and the toucans and the toucanets, and then they have a large back deck which is full of hummingbird feeders. So there is always something to look at uh, every minute of the day. That's a uh, just a more uh, close shot of the uh, golden tanager. This is the actually called the scarlet rumped tanager, but it's also referred to as the lemon rumped tanager for, for obvious reasons, given the lemon coloring on the rump. And with the color of its rump really depends on its range. It's one of those birds that has plumage ranges depending on, um, or plumage variation rather, depending on, on where in its range it is. So we've got just a really quick look at this guy. He wasn't a, a frequent visitor. This is the blue gray tanager. So quite a uh, widespread tanager throughout the, this reason, region and then all the way up in, in Costa Rica as well. In poor light, this bird is uh, sometimes mistaken for this guy, the palm tanager. They, they, Size-wise and shape-wise, they're virtually identical, but their coloring is different. And then the palms got the darker uh, wings on the, the bottom half of the wings, and then it's a bit more of a gray-green color. But um, in good light, they're easy to distinguish. But if you're looking at them in the forest understory or under the canopy, sometimes you've got to look a little more closely to, to confirm which tanager is visiting you. This is the silver-throated tanager which name is self-explanatory given that lovely silver throat. Although I'm also a pretty big fan of those electric green uh, wing bars as well. The colors on these birds is just spectacular. They light up the whole forest. This is the black capped tanager. The, I think this might actually be the one and only photograph we got of this guy. He came by really quickly, just Graced us, graced us with his presence for, for mere seconds, and then off he went, hopefully to get his toe look at, looked at. If you look closely, his, um, his toe looks like it's uh, been stubbed on a branch or is a little sore, so hopefully he was okay. This is the barrel spangled tanager. I'm going to linger on this one for a moment because it's Michael's favorite tanager. 
And that's a big deal for Michael, my husband. He's a very um, zen and pragmatic birder, unlike me who has like a, a list of targets and gets pretty worked up and pretty excited. Michael is very much of the attitude, we'll see the birds that we see, it's all great. But in the weeks leading up to our trip as our preparation sessions uh, intensified, I started to hear more and more about this barrel spangled tanager and the high hopes he had for it. So I, I know this bird holds a very special spot in his heart. I was thrilled that we got really good looks at it at the Choco Reserva, which is the first of the three eco lodges that we, we visited while staying at the Tandiapa Bird Lodge. It's a, just a wonderful tanager. And then, of course, I'm going to tell you about my favorite tanager. I mean, they all are, but this one, like especially, this is the flame faced tanager. And this is uh, one where it's another example where, depending on where you are in its range, the, the sum of the plumage may vary. So, uh, elsewhere in Ecuador, this guy's face is fire engine red. So, it kind of depends on, on where you are, but it's got those, those two variations. This is the metallic green tanager. And you can just tell I'm just restraining myself with holding back on the adjectives. It's not easy. This is the blue winged mountain tanager. So absolutely spectacular bird. Um, a bit of a sad story with this one recently. It was featured in uh, the BirdLife International publication. They had an article about the cage bird trade and they've actually have data on which color which plumage colors and which feather colors are more likely to result in the birds being targeted and this uh, this bird was discussed in that article because blue and yellow are actually quite popular colors so it was nice to see him in the forest where he belongs the blue capped tanager and our sorry blue cat mountain tanager and i'd like to uh, Totally agree with the name blue capped. It makes sense given that beautiful blue head, but you've also got to check out the yellow on his leg feathers. It looks like he's wearing yellow stockings. And so that was quite a highlight for us whenever he stopped by to check that out. Always a, a fun field mark to enjoy. Last but not least, the golden naped tanager. So some spectacular blues to, to end things off on with the tanagers. I'm going to zip as, as quickly as I can now to hummingbirds. Oh yeah, got my, good. okay. So the hummingbirds, this is the booted racket tail, the two males. Um, this is the bird that transformed my very prudent, I think we should arrive in Quito a day or two early to, we are staying at the Tandiapa Bird Lodge for five days. Uh, the, these uh, hummingbirds are absolutely responsible for that decision. Uh, there's a video on YouTube, if you just type in Tandiapa Bird Lodge feeders, that shows you what their hummingbird feeders look like. And uh, once I saw that, it was kind of game over. Um, the booted racket tail is probably the most numerous species that they have there. And um, what's not to love? You've got that remarkable tail. And then you've got, they basically look like they're wearing white pantaloons uh, around their feet, like these giant puff balls right where their feet are. And, and they're everywhere at Tandiapa Bird Lodge. Like they're the most numerous hummingbird and they're tiny little guys. They're really quite a small hummingbird. Now, pr probably about the same size or only slightly larger than the wood stars. And they are fierce defenders of their territory and the feeders. So they're smaller, their diminutive size is, uh, is not uh, a disadvantage for them. They were just delightful to watch. That's the female. So she doesn't have this, uh, the same tail, but she does have the, um, what I'm going to scientifically refer to as the leg poof. This is the Andean emerald. So you can see the beautiful turquoise on the head is just catching the light there. Slightly larger hummingbird than the booted racket tail. It was interesting to be at uh, Tandiapa for several days in a row because you could get a really good sense of uh, feeder dominance and which species were dominant and which weren't. Size was a factor, but it certainly wasn't determinative. It, it depended on many things and there were lots of fierce battles. So you quickly um, realize just what uh, remarkable fighters hummingbirds can be when they're when they're fighting over a food source and there was plenty to go around so they would either uh, do aerial combat that we observed or they'd sort of stagger their visits to the feeder um, by by species so that was interesting to get uh, a sense of that this is the purple bibbed white tip 
So in the right light, a beautiful purple gorget, and then the, the most uh, diagnostic field mark is that large tip on, on the tail. This was one of my favorite hummingbirds. This is the female fawn-breasted brilliant. This is one of probably the largest or um, among the largest of the species of hummingbirds at Tandiapa. In total, I think they had between 23 and 25 hummingbird species that regularly visit the lodge. We saw um, over 20 in our time there. So it's, it's possible to see quite a large number of hummingbird species. I loved this one because despite the size, a rather gentle hummingbird. And so she didn't, I didn't observe her bullying or, or messing with any of the other hummingbirds. She just sort of patiently waited her turn and uh, also was uh, very nice to, to pose for me on this branch. This is the male fawn-breasted brilliant. You can see that electric pink throat patch. I guess gorget when you're talking about hummingbirds. This is the buff-tailed coronet. I think I have more photos of this hummingbird than any other species. They were not shy. They landed on us numerous times. <laughs> they were um, quite, quite friendly, quite curious, quite gregarious, um, endless fun. They also have uh, a, a smaller version of the, the leg poof. Uh, and you can see from this rather dramatic pose that this guy's striking where they get the name from the, the buff tail coronet. So the buff coloring in the tail is, is what gives them that. These guys were quite dominant at, at the feeders at Tandiapa and, and elsewhere. This is the remarkable violet tailed sylph. Uh, the name is uh, self-explanatory. Um, I was delighted to get this photo. It just shows all the wonderful splendor of this bird. Quite, quite easy to see. It was delightful. It wasn't like we got one quick glimpse of this in the afternoon. They were, they were there throughout the day in multiple locations, so we were quite lucky to get good looks at them. And another species where there's quite a lot of sexual dimorphism, which is, is quite common in hummingbirds, but this is perhaps a more extreme example. This is the female. So short tail and then uh, completely different coloring on the breast with that uh, orange tummy. This is a uh, white necked Jacobin. So these guys are, um, they were relatively frequent visitors, but just zipped in and out. So they didn't stay long. They just uh, were all business. They came in, got their food and left. So. Uh, a bit a bit harder to photograph, but always delightful to see. This is the speckled hummingbird. Um, I think unjustly described as a drab hummingbird in several of the field guides. I don't like using that adjective uh, for birds. I think it's just more a question of having a subtler type of beauty. And I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of the pink feet on this one as well. we have the a sun angel. I've got to, you've got to love hummingbird species names. They're just <laughs> endlessly amusing. So this one is catching uh, the light in all the right ways. This was a crowd favorite, probably not surprising, the velvet, velvet purple coronet. Um, without, uh, when the light wasn't catching the feathers and, and, and uh, getting that iridescence, it's a, a very dark looking hummingbird. Um, but then when it catches the light, it's suddenly nature's disco ball. That's another, another photograph of the velvet purple coronet. This is the sapphire vented puff leg. And so um, and another one of those, um, the, the pantaloon wearing hummingbirds, although not quite at the, the scale or, or extent of the booted racket tail. Um, I'm, I'm headed in now to the hummingbirds that we saw at Zora Loma, which is the third of the and final lodge that we visited. This was at the highest level of elevation. And it was remarkable because even with an hour or two's journey to a different place, the species of hummingbirds was almost entirely different. So you didn't have to go far in this area of Ecuador, and I think in, in Ecuador in general, to get a, a almost completely different slate of birds. So this is the Tyrian metal tail. When you have a name like that, and you're that hardcore, you, you need a nap every now and again. Hummingbirds actually, given the extremes that they exist 
and in terms of the the constant fight for food actually do spend a quite amount quite a large amount of time roosting and, and resting to um to compensate for that so um i endlessly amused myself uh, looking at napping hummingbirds because uh, with all the tree branches around they would just uh, perch in the open and, and have a little snooze this is the mountain velvet breast. So this is the male. You see, you can notice the, the decurved bill. It's kind of got a hermit-like bill and then named for that black velvet um, looking appearance on the, the bottom of the breast feathers. This is the same, same species, but the female. This is the buff winged star frontlet named for the, the buff patch on the, on the back wing. Here we have the white bellied wood star. And now you will often hear wood stars before you see them. They sound like a very uh, loud and determined bumblebee. And so once you hear that sound, you'd look around and look for the teeniest, tiniest hummingbirds. They're quite small. These were among the smallest that we saw on our, on our trip there. So this is the, the male with that gorgeous pink gorget and then got the female as well. This is a lesser violet ear. So the violet ears, there are three species in total of violet ears that we saw. I'm just gonna uh, direct you to the ear feathers. They actually lift up. They're sort of not, I mean, conceptually similar to the tufted feathers in a, in a great horn where you've got the, the sort of tuft feathers that can move on their own. And that's the case with the ear patches on the violet ears. So this is the lesser. And then we've got the purple as well. So this photo, you can really see the, the prominence and the distinction of those of those ear patches that they can move. Turquoise is my favorite color, so I wasn't going to be able to limit myself to just one photograph of this bird. And so an, an example too of the different areas and the might depend on the um, level of dominance you see. These were occasional visitors at Tandiapa. You could see them daily, but they weren't by all means frequent visitors. And yet they almost dominated in, uh, in Zoraloma. So just a, an hour or two of travels can make quite a difference in, in, in those observations as well. This guy was kind of the star of the show. I mean, I. I love all hummingbirds, but my goodness. So this is the sword-billed hummingbird. This was the guy that I was thinking of when I faced my fear of the drive to get to Zoraloma. Uh, the roads in Ecuador overall weren't bad, but um, they, were, they weren't for the faint of heart or um, inflexible of spine, let's put it that way. Um, I got through it through a, thanks to a very ingenious uh, solution by Michael when he realized, okay, this is gonna be a challenge. Um, best to take away some sensory information. So I actually wore his sleep mask during the ride and then he just grilled me about hummingbird ID questions and that kept my brain occupied. Um, but sometimes in life you have to face your fears for the things you love. And I'm, I'm glad I, uh, I, I gritted my teeth through that to get to see this guy at the, at the top because he was unbelievably worth it. So the sword-billed hummingbird's bill is longer than its body. It has the longest bill to body ratio of any bird in the world. Its bill is so large and so uh, substantial, it actually can't use it to preen. And so hummingbirds don't have particularly strong feet. They can perch, but they can't really walk very well. But this guy's feet have actually evolved a little bit differently because he needs to use them to preen because he can't use the bill for that purpose. And you'd think with a bill like that, that it might be, you know, heavy, their heads might be hanging, but whenever they perched, it was proudly hoisted in the air. So this is a very typical pose for, for the sword bills that we saw. So um, you, as you would expect with a, a bill like that, they're going to favor the flowers with the very long corolla because they can access the nectar. The black-tailed train bearer, whose tail is so long, it's difficult to get it in one frame. <laughs> so we had to zoom out. <laughs> it was one of the amazing things about Ecuador is you're often zooming out to get the photos of hummingbirds rather than zooming in. But this, you can actually see the full splendor of the tail of the black-tailed train bearer. 
This is the collared Inca. So it looks like a fairly uh, dramatic black and white hummingbird, but it's actually in, in the right light. It's got some beautiful emerald feathers as well. And then of course, we've got uh, the spotlight hogging buff-tailed cornet, who's found a creative way to maximize nectar from this flower. We'll just cling to the flower itself. And he's actually gonna see us off to Galapagos now. When I saw that photograph, I thought, okay, that's the perfect one to end on. Off we go. So the tour group or the, that we went with uh, for our Galapagos trip is called Bird Quest. They are uh, an outfit out of the UK. I can't say enough good things about them. We were quite impressed and quite pleased, but you need to know when you book a trip with BirdQuest that you are on a mission. So if you have any visions of a relaxed and leisurely approach to the days, let go of that. You are birding pretty much every possible minute. Um, so that's why we, knowing that about BirdQuest, we, we took things relatively easy uh, in Ecuador. There's numerous ways to see the Galapagos Islands. You can do what are called land-based tours or you can do boat-based tours. We went with boat-based because, well, I really love boats. Um, and also Genovesa, which is one of the northernmost Galapagos Islands is um, bird mecca and you can't get there on a land-based tour. You have to go via boat. So that was one of the, the major considerations. This is the boat we were on. It's a uh, catamaran, the Nemo 3. It was fantastic. Um, but we were also spending quite a bit of time on this, the panga, um, P-A-N-J-A, -A, or G-A rather, it's a zodiac. So it gets you to and from where you need to go on the islands because you uh, can't actually um, bring the boat all the way up to the shore. So the catamaran would anchor in one of the calmer bays and then you take a short panga ride and either do a wet landing or a dry landing. And a wet landing is just as it sounds. You kind of hoist yourself off the side and get uh, wet up into your knees and then uh, walk onto shore. And usually with the assistance of a mockingbird or a sea lion, uh, change your shoes. <laughs> so right away we landed, um, we landed on Baltra Island. So we flew from Quito with a quick stopover in Guayaquil and then um, landed on Baltra, which is the airstrip that was built in World War II. And you can even bird at the airport in the Galapagos. So we saw a small ground finch right away. It's one of the best places actually to see the land iguanas. Um, and then shortly after unpacking and setting up on the catamaran, we were on our first I official island trip to North Seymour, which is just about an hour or two sail from Baltra. And North Seymour, um, so they, they, don't, they, they don't easy into things. You go right in right away is where there's the, one of the largest colonies of these guys the blue-footed booby, one of my all-time favorite birds there, I said it, um, and one of the iconic birds that's associated with the Galapagos Islands. So I, I selected this photograph because one of the ways to tell, um, to distinguish between the sexes and the blue-footed boobies is actually the eyes. And so if you look at the pupils, this is a male and the pupils are really, you can tell they've got a clear, clean circumference. Whereas when you look at the pupils on the female, it, there's more coloring around in the iris area and there's like an additional band of color on the outside of the pupil and it kind of looks a little bit like broken glass, like it's radiating out. Um, so that's one way to tell is the, is the eyes. The other is the sound. The females honk and the males whistle. Um, you can see if you look closely, there's a chick just poking out from under her tummy there. And it was just about to be feeding time. So. Um, I, I captured the whole sequence. And so this is the chick telling mom that it's, um, it's hungry, it's feeding time. So you see tapping on the bill there. And she was happy to oblige. So um, regurgitated some, some, uh, some fish for the chick. And just to give you a sense of my location as I'm as I'm shooting this, like I am, this is happening right beside the path. The paths in the Galapagos um, where you're able to walk are very, uh, very relatively narrow and pretty circumscribed. You can't just walk wherever you please. Uh, you have to stick to the path very, very carefully, but the birds don't know where the path is. And so they will set up their nests and feed wherever they see fit. So you've got to be uh, careful and respectful. 
There we go. All done. <laughs> that uh, cycle actually repeated itself several times before the chick was uh, was sated. Here we have two blue-footed boobies in their famous courtship dance. And here we go, the mandatory showing off of the blue feet. So he's got some uh, nesting material and the health of the male actually determines how blue the feet are. So the bluer the feet, the better condition he's in. And so that's part of the reason why they kind of do their foot dances when attracting mates is that they're advertising not only the, the beautiful color of their feet, but that's actually a signal of, of how they're doing health-wise. So important information for, for a prospective mate to know. You knew you were gonna get a close-up of the feet. <laughs> And you'll notice the band as well. Um, of course, all birds in the Galapagos are very closely um, monitored and tracked, although I'm, I'm happy to report that the number of boobies is actually uh, stable. I don't like, I know it's the scientific term, but I don't like using the term least concern. I think all species of birds should be of, of concern to us right now. But the birds, um, the, the three species of boobies that can be found in the Galapagos are all doing uh, reasonably well, so there hasn't been any, any steep or sharp declines. So that's, that's heartening information. Here we have a male, uh, quite excited about the, the eggs that he's guarding, got a protective toenail on one of them. And the, I just wanted to include this shot as a final one of the, of the blue-footed booby, just to give you an idea of their nests. They nest on the ground. And that nest is made, it's a ring of poop that is excrement. So they, that is how they, they delineate their, their nest. This is how they can nest when there aren't really that many or any predators to really concern them. So they're nesting out in the open. Um, and it's absolutely marvelous to see. This is the second species of booby that we saw. This is the Nazca booby. They've got large colonies on Genovesa and Española Island. Like the blue-footed booby, they also nest on the ground. They were um, quite amorous, a lot of the, the Nazca boobies that we saw, they were in full courting mode. So it was quite common to see them preening one another along the trail. And this is a juvenile Nazca booby. This is the third species of booby that we saw. This is the red-footed booby. And so as you can see from the, this one, it's perching on a, on a branch. These are able to perch and they also, uh, this species nests in, um, in trees and shrubs. So this was one of the draws for the um, boat-based tour is that the largest colony of red-footed boobies is found on Genovesa Island. Um, and they were, everywhere. It was just absolutely remarkable to see their, their colony and they were lots of them were, were nesting or gathering nest material. And there were quite a lot of juvenile, juvenile red-footed boobies about. And so these guys, um, we did two stops on Genovesa. We did the one in the morning, which was a, basically you walk up Prince Philip's steps is what they're called. The term steps is used somewhat loosely. It's quite a frantic clamber to the top of this cliff, but uh, well worth the effort. Um, and then we did a, a beach stop in Darwin Bay in the afternoon. And in between that, as we were sailing from one spot to the other, uh, we were um, escorted by about a dozen of these juvenile red-footed boobies. And they were really just kind of getting a sense of them themselves in terms of, of flying and perching and landing. And so they would actually, like they landed on some of us. It was uh, quite something. Uh, they uh, escorted us as well on our snorkeling excursion um, in between birding in the morning and the afternoon. Um, we also got to go snorkeling on most days, which was remarkable. Um, Genovesa is where we saw a school of hammerhead sharks and a seven footer swam right underneath Michael. So it's one of those moments where intellectually you, you know you're safe, but there's still that kind of visceral reaction when a shark goes right under your husband. Uh, still though, absolutely a, a beautiful sight to see. Here's a, um, a breeding red-footed booby on, her, on, on the nest. So you can see the facial skin is in full color. So it's a sign that they're in, in breeding mode. 
This is also a red-footed booby, but you'll notice the different color morph. So there are white red-footed boobies and there are brown morph red-footed boobies. The brown morph is a lot more common, I think probably around 80% or so. Uh, you can see both relatively easily on Genovesa, but the, the red-footed boobies are, um, are a lot less numerous. This one's gathering up some nesting material. So the sequence is a little bit heartrending, but it's also my segue into the next uh, species of bird I want to talk about. So, so bear with me. So here we have a red-footed booby who has spotted some nesting material that looks appealing. He's going to use this to try to, to attract and entice his mate, only to be foiled by a frigate bird. So the pirates of the sea, kleptoparasites, not only do they steal fish from, all, from a lot of the other birds, but they also take their nesting material because they're in competition for that too, as frigate birds are also stick nest builders. So this poor red-footed booby lost his branch to a frigate bird. But it, as I said, it does give me a segue now to talk about frigate birds. So there's two species of frigate bird in the Galapagos Island. We have the great frigate bird and the magnificent frigate bird. And um, I have to admit, I, got, I was a little bit um, skeptical when I was doing my research for the trip in terms of figuring out how to tell the two species apart, um, because a lot of the material I consulted referred to the color of the eye ring on the female, and it's red in the great and blue in the magnificent. And I thought, um, on what planet am I getting close enough to a frigate bird where I'm going to see the eye ring? Um, because until then, we'd seen them in Mexico, and they were these these great creatures of the distant sky. Um, the Galapagos, you do get that close to frigate birds. It was spellbinding. It was absolutely stunning. And so here we have a female great frigate bird. And you can see that powerful hooked bill. Here's a magnificent female frigate bird. Um, there's both can be found on North Seymour, and then there's a huge colony of frigate birds on Genovesa, a lot more, if not exclusively, great frigate birds there. So the island will tell you, it might give you some clues as to which ones you're seeing. Here's the juvenile, and people who, who bird with me know that I've got a bit of a thing for bird feet, so I'm going to, of course, direct your attention to um, the really cool feet on this frigate bird. So here we have a male great frigate bird and the females can be told apart by the color of their eye ring with the males it's the color of their feather sheen. And so from a distance they look like they're all black but when you get closer their backs actually have different sheens uh, to the dark feathers depending on whether it's a great or a magnificent. So the easy way to remember it is great green and then the magnificent is sort of a purpley burgundy sheen. So this one is, is a great frigate bird. This just gives you a sense of, of the landscape as you're walking along the path. You see these frigate birds with their guller pouches inflated and they're just dotting the landscape with that shock of color. And it, it's, it's truly a spectacular sight. And it's not as though you see one every kilometer or so, like they are everywhere um, on, on Genovesa and on North Seymour, more on Genovesa. That's probably the most densely concentrated colony of, of frigate birds we saw on the whole trip. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, there's stick nest builders, so there's a, a sense of the nest. It, I, I found it difficult to restrain myself when including photographs of, of this species. They're just so absolutely stunning. I, I know from the perspective of other birds, they, they behave badly because their main um, method of getting food is, is kleptoparasitism. So they do torment the, the tropic birds and the, and the boobies. Um, and you can you see that in, in the in the sky somewhat often. They're absolutely gorgeous in their own right. This shot gives you a really good sense, I think, of that green feather sheen and what you're looking for in that uh, in that color. I included this one as well, just because I mean, looking at an inflated guller patch on the frigate bird, I don't I don't think it ever gets old. But um, you see that sharp. Uh, bill, uh, that um, pronounced hook, and that 
its proximity to the gullar pouch, that made me a little bit nervous because I thought, oh goodness, are they going to puncture themselves? But they obviously know what they're doing, but he's still in this photo, but they would rock back and forth and actually bounce off of their gullar pouch. And it kind of like the way we'd use an exercise ball. It was remarkable to watch. And this just blew me away, but they flew sometimes with their gullar uh, pouch, either like it somewhat like partially inflated. So they'd fly around with this um, gullar pouch hanging down be beneath them. It was, it was something else. And so I've, I've shown you the, the beautiful, aesthetically pleasing shots of frigate birds. Um, now I'm going to also portray them in, you know, what their, their typical conduct, um, a frigate bird in action. This is a female frigate bird, this poor pelican. Um, so we've got a pelican who's just been given a little treat from this is uh, taken near the fish market in on Santa Cruz on our final day in the Galapagos and this pelican's just gotten some fish We've got the juvenile pelican behind her hoping she's going to share um, besieged by a frigate bird and then if you look in the upper right hand corner a sea lion's trying to get in on the action so not an easy life for a pelican sometimes in the Galapagos but um they also do get a bit of a break. The fish market was uh, quite an amazing spot to see pelicans up close. And um, you do not want to get in the way between a pelican and a fish. Um, I tried not to, but um, they were so keen on the samples that were going to be given to them that one of them actually winged me out of the way. So um, quite something. I can say firsthand as I immediately sprawled on all fours, pelicans have very powerful wings. <laughs> So um, this is not a separate uh, species of pelican. This is the brown pelican, but like many species of birds in the Galapagos, it's actually um, a, like a, a subspecies or a separate race. So it's sort of the Galapagos version of that bird. And the, uh, this version of the brown pelican or this uh, race or subspecies has that really pronounced chestnut coloring in the neck. And that's probably a good moment to pause and just talk about generally the rates of endemism in the Galapagos. And when I say that, I mean the rate of endemic birds. When a bird is endemic, it means it's unique or special to that area. You're not going to see it anywhere else. Um, the Galapagos has exceptionally high rates of, of endemism. And so for, I think there are 65 birds that are, are resident breeding birds there, 33 of those are endemic. So that's almost a 50% rate of, of endemism, which is, is pretty extraordinary. And then of the non-endemic birds that are present there, a lot of them are the Galapagos race or subspecies of that bird. So there'll be some sort of differentiation, usually in plumage that um, is associated with that bird. So uh, this next part of the presentation is, is dedicated to Karen because we're now on to the gulls. I know those are, are her favorite and she's been patiently waiting in great suspense to have the, the reveal for the world's rarest gull. So here we go. Um, this one isn't it, next one, but this is, we're going to start things off with the swallow-tailed gull. So um, many people are of the view that this is the most beautiful gull in the world. I think it's a stunning gull. I personally am still rather partial to the ring build, traditional that way. Um, but this bird in, in flight, even though it's, it's larger than a Sabine's gull, its um, wing pattern and the feathers is somewhat similar. Um, it's different though in the sense that it's got this massive eye. And one of the reasons for that is that it's a nocturnal hunter. So it hunts at night and it hunts largely squid. So this is a close up shot of that really spectacular eye. And neat, I thought in a neat photograph of their tongue too. And then of course they've got that beautiful white blue tip on the bill. So the swallowtail gulls, they were, um, a lot of them were in a breeding or courtship mode. And so they were quite, they were, uh, quite easy to observe and they were um, in very good numbers on a number of the islands and beautiful both on, on land and in flight. Very dramatic against the, the lava rocks. And of course they're trying to catch a nap during the day but uh, any parent can probably relate to this shot of when you would just really like to sleep and uh, your chick is not going to allow that to happen. So mom was not waking up. I think that this one, she needed a rest. I included this photo because, well, I mean, you can't really ever have too many of an adorable gull chick, but um, just to give you a sense of how careful you had to be when you were walking. 
So we were, again, this is on Genovesa that this photograph was taken and the paths were fairly well delineated. This was actually in Darwin Bay, so it was mostly beach, but you had to be so exceptionally careful where you walked because the birds were of course impervious to those boundaries and they'll, they'll nest and they'll um, rest or stop anywhere. And so, um, like I didn't see any anyone step on anything or during our trip, everything was fine, but you always had to kind of have your, your wits about you, which is easier said than done when you're staring at these unbelievable sights um, at all times. So you kind of had to keep half a mind to make sure you weren't, uh, weren't stepping anywhere you shouldn't be. But uh, this little chick was unscathed and quite happily walking about the beach. So this is just to be clear, this is a, a swallowtail gull chick. And this is the juvenile swallowtail gull. I think the juvenile plumage uh, is just absolutely stunning. I mean, I'm probably that this may be influenced by the fact that I'm looking at that and thinking charcoal drawing. Um, I'm drawn to those those uh, gradations of, of gray and black and white, but very dramatic. And I love the dark eye. It kind of reminded me of a, of a teenager going through a bit of a goth phase. So very striking, dramatic gull. Here we go, Karen, world's rarest gull. This is the lava gull. And so um, you can debate where it got its name, whether the coloring um, helps it to camouflage against the lava rocks where it's often found, or whether when it opens its bill, the inside of its mouth is a bright red like molten lava. And so that, that could be a source as well. Um, you can just see the tip of its bill here is that, that shocking red. Um, it's the rarest gull in the world, not or um, referred to as such, not because it's particularly difficult to see. We actually watched one bathe in the hotel swimming pool, non-chlorinated or chemicalized, thankfully. But um, so these gulls are are uh, quite um, easy to spot in the Galapagos, but their numbers, because they are endemic, are, are extraordinarily small for a gull. So, uh, depending on the sources you consult, uh, the rare uh, or the um, the world, Birds of the World database has their numbers at somewhere between 800 and 1,000 in total. So that's, that's where they get that distinction from. So very small numbers for a gull. It's a profile shot. So here we have a wedge-rumped storm petrel. You can just see him sort of uh, taking off, see that white rump patch. Um, I included this shot to show you their burrows. So this is Genovesa. This is um, our reward for clambering up the Prince Philip steps and getting to the top. There's about a two kilometer um, loop path that you can walk along. And the storm petrels, um, this is where their, their burrows are. And so they're, they're there in extraordinarily large numbers. So that's, that's what the skies look like in Genovesa. So you can see why this is such a, a critical destination for, for birders in the Galapagos. And many, many Galapagos tours don't include Genovesa um, because it is so far north. It was the second island we visited. We, right after we wrapped up on North Seymour on our first day, we pretty much set sail right away. And I think it was somewhere between 10 and 14 hours to get there in um, relatively rough seas, um, but it's, it's absolutely worth it. It's especially if you're if you're interested in birds, Genovesa is is an incredible island to visit. Now, when you have this many um, or numbers uh, like this in terms of small storm petrels, you're going to have raptors. And so this is the Galapagos race of the short eared owl. You can see its plumage is somewhat darker than ours that we are used to seeing here in Alberta. Um, somewhat surprisingly, and I think uh, to our guide's chagrin, we actually didn't see one on Genovesa. We saw this fellow on Isabella Island several days later. So I think he was a bit nervous when we dipped on the short eared in Genovesa because that's where you where you usually see it. They they snack on the storm petrels. I'm actually not sad that I didn't see that. Um, we watched this one enjoy um, a mouse. So we stood on the roadside just for a, about half an hour or so, and we're. Um, got some some incredibly good looks at this owl. There's two species of owl in Galapagos. The other is a barn owl. Back to storm petrels. This is the Elliot storm petrels. So the the ballerinas of the sea. 
Um, they are a member of the tube nose family and they will uh, scoop up zooplankton with their bill and they'll just get a lot of their food from the surface of the water. So they'll just skim it. But as they're doing that, they it looks like they're ballet dancing on the surface. It's, it's just an absolutely beautiful sight. And so uh, a rather difficult photograph to get. All the photographers on the trip were sort of um, elbows out, kneeing on or um, kneeling on the back of the boat, trying to to hold still long enough to get a shot of these uh, of these storm petrels doing their beautiful, graceful dances. This is Michael's shot. All of mine were uh, blurry. <laughs> That's one in flight. You can see in the profile there the tube nose. So there's three species of storm petrel that you can see on the Galapagos: the wedge rump, the band-tailed, and then the Elliots. This is a, these are brown knotties. So they're a member of the tern family. Very dramatic birds. Uh, they are in, they're uh, easily seen alongside a lot of the cliffs, but then they're also frequenting the harbors as well. This was one of the first birds that I saw when we landed, um, when we were just boarding the, the panga to take us to our, sounds lovely, to take us to our catamaran. It was, not very many times you get to say that, but um, these guys are, are quite easy to spot and uh, are there in relatively good numbers and quite fun to watch as well. They swoop very gracefully along the water in, in flight. There's one in some rather dramatic lighting. Lots of herons as well on the Galapagos Islands. So this is a sleeping yellow crowned night heron who was just kind of snuggled up in the lava rocks um, on Genovesa and Darwin Bay. And this is the heron that's endemic to the Galapagos. This is the lava heron. Now, depending on which checklist you follow, some um, refer to it as the striated heron and don't separate it out as a separate species. Um, but I think it deserves to be. So it's the lava heron and lives on the lava rock. And I, I won't digress too much on this, but can I just take a moment to express my enthusiasm for the working group that is going to work to, to consolidate and join all the different checklists together from a taxonomical standpoint. Uh, to be a fly on the wall in those meetings would be, I mean, Netflix has got to get in on that because that would just be some, some interesting and rather heated discussions, I would imagine. So the lava heron, uh, as its name suggests, is um, often found skulking among the lava rocks, uh, feasting on crabs. So this is not the easiest heron to spot because it, it is quite well camouflaged and, and blends in pretty well. But uh, if you watch closely, you can usually, usually see a few of them. Here's the juvenile in full heron crouch mode. Oh, and now, the waved albatross. So um, aside from a handful of these guys that, that uh, nest on another tiny island off the coast of Ecuador, most of the world's population of the, of the waved albatross resides on Española Island in the Galapagos. It gets its name, the waved albatross, from that gorgeous vermiculation on its breast and stomach feathers. And from April till December, they're in breeding mode and raising their young mode. And so when we were there in late May, there were quite a number of albatross on the top of the cliffs uh, on Española that were on eggs or um, waiting for mates or finding mates. So it was, they were there in relatively good numbers. It was absolutely extraordinary to be close to these magnificent birds. In every part of an albatross is extraordinary, but I am particularly partial to their special bills. It's the tube nose. Those deep, soulful albatross eyes. Uh, it was actually a little disconcerting how close we were to them, not um, by intention, but on Española particularly, the path is very narrow and very limited. You, you, and you can't stray from it because you'll be right in their, their breeding territory. And yet some of their nests were either on or just immediately adjacent to the path. And it was a little bit, you kind of held your breath as you were walking by these albatross so close. I was nervous that we were going to, that they were going to be distressed, but they seemed absolutely impervious to our presence. Many of them were napping. 
So they were very, very uh, calm and relaxed albatross, except when they were trying to entice a mate. Then we heard the beak clacking and um, their calling as they were doing their uh, albatross courtship rituals, which was extraordinary. And as I mentioned, a lot of them were on eggs. And so at one point, uh, one got up to, to turn the egg and do a quick preen. Here's that. And you can really get a good sense in this photograph of the vermiculation and the, the, that uh, gives this bird its name, the waved albatross. And here she is in majestic takeoff mode. And you can see just uh, behind her on the cliffs, a blue-footed booby. I have most of my shots in, in Espanola are of course of the, the albatross, but it's covered in seabirds. So there's um, lots of boobies, lots of gulls. It's, it's really a remarkable and enchanting place. And in flight. Now this last, these last few shots of the albatross really shows you, just to give you a sense of how narrow that path was and the conundrum I faced as I worked my way back at the end of our time on Espanola, that sea lion is where I had to walk to get back. And so I faced the dilemma of close up encounter with a sea lion versus getting way closer than I would have liked to the albatross. So I wasn't quite sure what to do. So um, sometimes the best thing to do is just sit still and the sea lion came up to inspect me. He gave me a couple of good sniffs, decided I was not that interesting and I was allowed to pass. So that's how I got myself out of that. Uh, where there are so many seabirds and cliffs, you'll often see red-billed tropic birds. So here's a shot of one of those splendid creatures. And another raptor of the Galapagos, the only resident diurnal hawk there, this is the um, Galapagos hawk. It's actually taxonomically, or, or not taxonomically, anc ancestrally related to our Swainson's hawk. So a bit of an Alberta connection there to this wonderful raptor. And then another highlight, the Galapagos penguin. This one is molting. So this is a, an adult that we saw on the cliffs off of Fernandina, who's just face to the sun, drying off those feathers as, as she's going through a molt. And then I zoomed out a bit because where else in the world can you get a marine iguana right next to a penguin? That's the magic of the Galapagos right there. This is the flightless cormorant. So this is the largest of the cormorant species. Um, and you can see those big powerful legs that have evolved this this uh, cormorant dives more deeply than any of the, the other cormorants, but uh, over time has lost the ability to fly. So this is a juvenile, as you can tell the eyes are dark. Otherwise, when they're adults, they have bright emerald eyes. Um, this photo just shows at any given time in the Galapagos, you are choosing what you are going to photograph and there's always uh, plentiful options. And so these are fur seals, Galapagos fur seals, uh, juveniles. Is that uh, cormorant. You can see the, the vestigial wings there and those powerful, powerful diving legs. And then the obligatory wing shot. And that's actually gonna transition us out into the next uh, little mini slideshow I have, which is all about the finches. So I'm going to give an obligatory caveat at the beginning of this because finch identification in the Galapagos is not always straightforward. There's the H word, hybridizing. Um, so I'm, I've started with those that I'm relatively certain of. There's 18 species of finch that are known as the Darwin's finches. 17 are resident in the Galapagos. 14 live on the islands that are accessible to tourists. Unless your name is David Attenborough or you are a researcher, you're not going to be able to see um, the other three. So we were on a mission to get all 14 and um, I'll, I'll kill the suspense, we did but it took some doing. So this is the first finch. This is the, uh, in the slideshow, this is the vegetarian finch. This is the largest of the Galapagos finches and it's got that um, somewhat stubby parrot-like bill. This is the woodpecker finch, quite a famous finch because it is known for using cactus spines as tools to dig insect larvae out of tree branches. So this one's got a, that beautiful uh, thick bill. It's uh, black, so that's in, that means it's in breeding mode. Another shot of that woodpecker finch inspecting some, some insect larvae. 
This is a warbler finch. There's two species of warbler finch on the Galapagos, the green warbler finch and the gray warbler finch. Neither is particularly green or gray, so that adds a, an additional layer of fun to the identification, and sometimes they co-occur on the same island. This one is a gray, and this one is a green, as you can tell by the buffy coloring. Um, that's the buffy coloring is actually one of the, the signals for that. And then there's a, a different difference in colorations in the bills as well. So these guys get their name from that um, warbler-like bill that they've got. And then the cactus finches, there's been a number of developments taxonomically with the cactus finches. It used to be, um, common cactus and large cactus, and that's recently changed. This is now the Genovesa cactus finch. There we go. That shows you <laughs> cactus finch doing what cactus finches do. So they've got that larger but elongated bill. Now, the fact that the finch is on a cactus doesn't mean that it's a cactus finch. Lots of uh, ground finches are, are seen on, on cacti quite regularly. Um, but this one by the bill and uh, the, it's on Genovesa as well is uh, Genovesa cactus finch. Genovesa also got its own uh, sharp-billed ground finch relatively recently. And so this is the male. And this is not to be outdone by Genovesa. This is the Espanola ground finch. Um, so it was for a time um, Espanola cactus finch, but then uh, genetically was found to be more closely related to ground finches. So this is the Espanola ground finch. Basically, if you're on Espanola and you see a large billed finch, you're probably looking, or rather almost certainly looking at an Espanola ground finch. So now we've got the ground finches, the more traditional small, medium, and large variety. There is quite a lot of variation with these. And so this is an example of a small ground finch, but again, they do, they do hybridize. So this is a male, so all black. Um, and then it's not based on the bill, tells you whether they're breeding or not. Black bill generally means breeding. This is a small ground finch um, by the pronounced gape, like a juvenile. Another small ground finch. Just, just, I just wanted to give you a sense of the plumage variation as well as the, the um, variation in bill color with these. So now we move to a medium ground finch. We saw finches on pretty much every island we visited, but it was really on the last day or so uh, when we were on Santa Cruz and we'd gotten off the boat and were, had moved to the land tour for the last uh, day or so that we saw a lot of the finches, which also meant the heat was on because it was see them now if we hadn't seen them yet or, or don't see them. So um, on our in our tour group, we had some quite established listers, some member of members of the, the 9000 club. So rarefied air up there so you could kind of feel the the tension as the we were trying to get all the finches for our lists it's the female medium ground finch and then i'm just going to prepare you for the next um blitz of large ground finches i love all the birds in the galapagos this is probably my favorite so i really had to try to restrain myself with the number of photos but i just i adore this finch i cannot get enough of this finch so there's probably more photos of this than there are of anything else so bear with me this is the large ground finch um pretty much all of these shots are from genovesa where we were treated to close views of uh, quite a number of them they were very very confiding and curious there it is doing what made them famous, cracking those large seeds with those miraculously large bills. I could not include that shot. I mean, my goodness, look at that beautiful bird. You wonder when you see like, how am I gonna be able to tell between a medium and a large ground finch? And then you see the large ground finch's bill and you say, oh, okay, there we go. So it's got that very pronounced uh, large colman and then it goes up pa well past its forehead. So the fine, I'm rounding off on the finches here. So this is the last but not least, the tree finch. This is a small tree finch. We've got that uh, black hood. And you can see the bill is shorter and stubbier on the tree finches. Whether they're on a tree or not is not always helpful. There were lots of ground finches in trees medium tree finch. And then you wait your entire life for photos like this. Look at that. 
left. This is the large tree finch. This one we fought for for six hours in the rain. And with 10 minutes of daylight left, our guide, uh, I think, called in a personal favor and got us on some uh, private land of a, of a friend who had seen one recently. And oh my goodness, the suspense, but we got him. <laughs> I'm going to move now to mockingbirds and other land birds rather quickly. And so there's four species of mockingbird in the Galapagos. A lot easier to distinguish than finches because all you need to know is which island you're on. So this is the Galapagos mockingbird. And um, this is the most common mockingbird in the Galapagos. There's six subspecies. This one was photographed on Genovesa. They're endlessly entertaining, these mockingbirds. Uh, this one is the San Cristobal mockingbird. So it's got uh, a slightly brownish wash to the face and then the, um, the breast and tummy area is more intermediate plumage, so a bit lighter. This is probably the most famous one. This is the Española. These guys are unbelievably tame. And th there's a couple of things that are notable about them. Firstly, the bill is the longest of all the species of mockingbirds. Um, it's got that red eye and it's also believed, um, scientists are starting to uh, think it's going to be the next flightless bird in the Galapagos. It's starting to use its flight powers a lot less. It kind of accompanies you much like a, a determined and small gray roadrunner when you're there and they just sort of hop along beside you. Um, they're, they're into your camera, they're landing on your bag. So they're, they're very friendly and they eat these. <laughs> this is the Galapagos centipede, so not commonly seen. We saw this one um, rather unusually strolling along the beach, but I'm not, not kidding. The mockingbirds actually eat these and feed them to, your, to their young. Don't know if they rip the legs off first as a courtesy, but um, here we have the Galapagos centipede. And then the rarest of the mockingbirds, this is, you can only see this one from a boat. So we're sort of in the panga first thing in the morning. This is uh, the Floriana mockingbird, which you can be viewed off of Champion Island, usually seen on top of a cactus. If you're lucky, one will bounce down to the rocks and you'll get a better look. And you can see this one's uh, double banded. And then from a field mark standpoint, it's got that, uh, that patch on the, on the uh, chest. This is the Galapagos flycatcher. And then we've got the Galapagos dove, an absolutely beautiful dove. It's got that gorgeous patch of iridescence on the throat, which can be pink or gold or green. And of course that beautiful uh, blue eye ring. This is the mangrove warbler in the Galapagos. And so only warbler that's there, that's resident, I believe, and tons of plumage variation on this one. Looks a lot like our yellow warbler, only it's got, it's got that red cap. And unlike our warbler, very easy to photograph at eye level, very friendly. Um, this one was checking us out as we were patiently wa waiting for the paint build Craig to make an appearance. He's kind of looking at us going, what, what are you guys all doing standing there in raincoats for two hours at a time? This is what we were doing. So um, I got some other um, landscape photos as we were waiting for this guy to make an appearance. So for the plant lovers, here's some Galapagos hydrangea and a painted lady butterfly. And then while this is, all of these shots were taken, we did a hike of the Sierra Negra volcano on Isabella Island. It's about an eight kilometer hike, it's lovely. Um, and lots of lots of interesting things to see on the way, including this um, Darwin's flycatcher. And so this is split from the vermilion flycatcher. It's somewhat similar, although the females look uh, quite a bit different, but the males are that same glowing red. Unfortunately, the numbers of this bird are declining rather steeply, so they are difficult to see. Um, they've been they've been struggling with the fruit fly that's evolved to eat to predate on their on their eggs and their young. That's the, the caldura at the top of Isabella, or at the top of uh, Sierra Negra. Some Galapagos flamingos. <laughs> um, these guys were in a swamp at the base of uh, Isabella. Black neck stilt. I have not done anything to that photograph to alter the color of the water. It's what it actually looked like. And then the one resident duck of the Galapagos, not endemic. This is the white-cheeked pintail. It can be seen uh, elsewhere as well, but there's a decent number of them on the Galapagos. And that um, green, those green scapular feathers are obviously something to write home about. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful duck. And then 
um, the Galapagos Martin. So this is an endemic. It's quite, it's uh, closely related to the purple Martin that we have here. Quite a bit more difficult to see. We were up on the Pangas at five in the morning um, trying to get glimpses of these guys in the cliff. And you can just see in the middle, the juveniles poking his head out there. Here's a closer shot. You can see the juvenile with that, um, that lighter bill and that pronounced gape. And then the, the male on the right there. And then the final bird of the Galapagos that I've got is the dark billed cuckoo. And this friendly fellow was feeling very sorry for all of us traipsing through the rain trying to get the large tree finch. And so he behaved in a very uncuckoo like manner and sat in an open branch for a while to uh, console us uh, during those during those struggles. So we forever grateful for that. And then I, I'm all about the birds, but there's in Galapagos, there's just so many remarkable creatures to see as well. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least um, give you a quick whirlwind overview of some of the other wonders that we encountered. This is a male sea lion. Um, when one of these comes clambering towards you, it um, really gets that heart rate up, but they weren't uh, in, in breeding mode, so you're relatively safe. This is a beach on San Cristobal, or sorry, Santa Fe Island. So just sea lions galore, and they were so friendly. This photograph kind of hit home after a week of um, being very well fed. The food, both at the Tandiapa Bird Lodge and on the, the boat was uh, incredible. So I was really uh, relating to these sea lions by about day 10 of our trip. This is uh, one of the land iguanas. So this was photographed on North Seymour, but they're actually introduced there or being introduced there to address declining numbers. So this guy looks like he's, he's had enough for one day. This is another species of land iguana that you can see on Santa Fe. It's a lot lighter in color. This was one of the last photographs I took. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation on Galapagos, one of the best places to see the land iguana is actually at the airport. So where else can you see a creature as majestic as this just before you board a plane? Um, there's lava lizards on every island in the Galapagos and they all have different colors depending on which island you're on. And so I've, I've got a, just a, a small sampling here. Um, this was, I called this my, my guardian angel lava lizard. This is the female on Española. She was right by my side the entire time during that somewhat precarious rocky hike. And so I felt a lot better having, having her there to guide me. This is the male uh, Española lava lizard. This is the Santa Fe lava lizard. I believe that's the male. And this is the Floriana lava lizard. So these guys are fun to, to collect as you go along. Um, this is what it looks like on Fernadina. This is the marine iguanas, the only species of iguana in the world that is a true marine iguana. So it feeds underwater on, uh, on algae. And Fernandina is carpeted with these guys and they will not move. They're, they're not aggressive. They're not gonna bite you or, or harm you or anything, but they were there first, you're on their turf and you are kind of picking your way um, over them. <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. So it's just an extraordinary sight. And to see these guys, even um, more extraordinary is to see them in the water. So as I said, they are marine iguanas and we got on our last snorkeling trip, we got the pleasure of snorkeling with them, which was just truly remarkable. They'd um, eat the, the algae underneath the water and then swim up and break the surface and you'd go up and you would just feel like you were surrounded by dinosaurs. It was, it was an incredible sight. Um, as was this, this is not usual at all. There are three species of snakes in the Galapagos, but they're they're difficult to see. And our guide had actually never seen this. This is a snake slithering over a marine iguana. Usually you see the snakes um, when it's the iguana breeding time and the snakes will predate their eggs. But the snake was just out for a slither on a sunny day. And like us, uh, you have to go over the marine iguanas because they're not moving for you. This is um, the, one of the marine iguanas on Española. They're sometimes called the Christmas iguana because they've got red and green coloring. So they're, all of them are beautiful, but they, they do, their coloring does differ depending on the islands. And this one is, is often a favorite because it's, it's fairly bright. This is my favorite shot of the whole trip. This is Galapagos at it in it. Like this is the essence of Galapagos. Marine iguanas, uh, mockingbird, it's, <laughs> that was on Española. And then this is what most of the lava rocks look like. They are covered with sally light foot crabs. 
So very um, bright and remarkable crab. The, the bright red ones are the fully grown adults. You can see if you look closely a smaller black crab. So they're dark when they're juveniles and then they lighten and brighten as they age, just like we do. So here's a, a close up of one feeding. And this just gives you an idea of the, the variations on the size and shell as they're at various stages of their, their growth and development. I wish I had a scientific explanation for this, but I don't. I've done some research, even consulted my Crabs of the World book, but no idea why he's squirting water out of his nose, but I sure am glad Michael got that photograph. And then I'm going to end with oh, adjectives even escape me with these guys. These are the giant uh, Galapagos tortoises. We were lucky to see them on three different islands. Two were uh, breeding centers and one when they were roaming in the wild. And so they eat these apples, which are quite poisonous to people. There's signs everywhere not to even touch the leaves because they'll give you instant blisters. And just, just look at that face. No sound was coming out when this just, uh, just expressing himself silently, like a silent movie star. And there's some, some uh, younger guys at one of the, the breeding centers kind of squaring off. This is a female. The females and the males are quite a bit different in size. The males are tremendously large. And I mean, the females for a tortoise are large as well, but uh, about half or a third of the size of the males. I had to get a close up of the foot. And then this is my my final photo, just to give you a sense of the tortoise in, in all, of its, all of its majesty. We were so lucky to be able to, to walk around with them on our final day there and uh, watch them roam free in the wild. It was truly tremendous. So I will thank you for your patience. I made it in just an, under an hour and a half. Um, I'm happy to stay for questions if people have to go. I completely understand if it's bedtime, no problem. Um, Otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to stay and, and, and answer questions. Or if you would like to email me at any point, if you've got questions that I can answer in more detail, if you're thinking of a trip here, I'm, I'm happy to be a, re a resource in, in any way that I can. So thank you so much for, for being here tonight and for your attention throughout the presentation. Thank you so much, Terry Susan. That was awesome. Your photography was incredible. Your commentary was fantastic. And as like somebody said, it was almost like we were also being there with you, sharing on your journey that you took. That was that was great. So um, I hope everybody can give you a you know a hand clap. It was it was awesome. And thanks again for you know being with us. I'm just going to take a minute and uh, turn off the recording. And we'll get some questions 